Welcome to my free series of leadership and ritual facilitation videos. You can donate to help me offer more of these classes and write on these topics. There's more information in the video details below. Yes, so ritual aftercare, and yes, I am using that word on purpose. Mm -hmm. um, I have witnessed rituals where the participants aren't quite themselves, even after rituals close, They've grounded their energy, they've had something to eat, and they are still not themselves. So what we, in what ways can we care for those who basically are still in aftershocks of the magic? You know, you know, when the magic is over, how can we help them come back to themselves? Well, um, so there's, there's kind of, there's two, two answers I'll give on that. Um, and one is, you know, you've covered a lot of the basics, like you've talked about doing formal grounding, um, getting people to eat. I would say, you know, I'll, I'm a ritual heretic. I, I would say getting people to eat something uh, is far more effective than let's all ground together. Um, I'm, again, it's ecstatic, it's physical. Eating it is an ecstatic experience and, uh, and it's an embodied experience. And so the, that actual physical act of eating is going to, in general, it's going to do more than just, and let's everybody ground together because not everybody necessarily has the same skills with it, with grounding. And for that matter, uh, the word grounding is kind of a confusing word sometimes because if you've done a really energetic ritual or a really emotionally intense ritual, there's going to be energy. There's going to be energy in that ritual and, and that's okay. You want that energy and you, you, work with that energy, but you can't be surprised when people are all buzzed after that ritual. And it's not to say that you can just all of a sudden ground and then those endorphins are gone. So there's a, there's a couple things. And again, it goes back to structure. Um, I often have a potluck, even if it's just snacks, I'll have like a potluck snack kind of a thing after a ritual. Um, if the ritual is before dinner, then dinner would be after, but typically I'm, I'm, when I'm doing rituals um, that are more intensive, it's at night. So, you know, it would be some, some kind of snacky something that they can eat. Um, make sure people have time to do that decompression. So like if you've rented a ritual space and you're doing that ritual and then it's like, you know, okay, the ritual's done. You don't have to go home, but you can't stay here you know, that doesn't give some folks enough time to, to process that. And so you want to make sure that they have time. And, you know, I, I actually, I'll, I'll do another, you know, be another, say another ritual heretic thing. I sometimes think that for public rituals, like the entire purpose of the ritual uh, or one of the purposes of the ritual is just as a big, big social icebreaker um, that you're, that what you're doing by doing that ritual together is you're giving a bunch of people who don't know each other a common topic that they can actually discuss with each other and they can meet other people because they now have this common topic. They, you know, they, they have this shared experience and this thing that they can talk about. So like that's because one of my goals with any ritual is also community building. So now you've got all these folks who, um, the, uh, they, they, you know, they, let's just be honest, a lot of pagans are socially awkward. <laughs> And, you know, and I talk to folks all the time that are really nervous about going to rituals. They're nervous about going to events. They don't know anybody. And, you know, you've gone through this ritual and suddenly they, you know, they, they, they've got some, they've raised some energy and they, and they now have, you know, other folks there that they can talk to because they've, they've got this commonality. So I think, you know, I think that it's okay to be energized after ritual. And, and just as long as you make sure that people, you know, have a place to kind of spin that energy out one way or the other. Um, I'll go into I'll go into self responsibility in just a moment. But in in the chat room, you said, <laughs> "Can we talk about the misnomer of grounding?" Um, so, tell tell me more about that because I, I I have a couple of different ways that there are a couple different ways that people have, that I hear people use the term grounding and and they're different. Well, I've actually stopped using the term altogether because, from what I've learned and what I've been taught in many different ways grounding has always been taught one way but understood another they teach us to ground grind, ground your energy send it all down to the ground 
but the language there doesn't really serve because in my experience, you aren't sending all of your energy down into the ground. You're trying to balance your energy. You take off all the excess so that you aren't basically walking around like an energetic zombie or unenergetic zombie at times. So I've actually had to like throw out the term and say, okay, balance your energy, take off all the excess so that you are now back to yourself. You can be a little buzzed, but if there's anything that you, you're, you're energetic or can't handle, you need to take it out. And I just, yeah, drives me a little nutty. I, I will admit the only reason I use the term is because it's so commonly used and because people ask me about it. Um, I don't really use the word, or in, indeed, I don't really use that function, at least not in the way it's usually, like the, for me, and again, I'll, I'll commit yet, yet another ritual heresy here. I don't really believe that I can send my energy down into the ground. It, it's so vague and so woo woo, and it just doesn't, it just doesn't make sense to me. It doesn't, because for me, energy is my body. If I'm singing and I've raised up my, my, uh, my heartbeat by singing and dancing, that's energy. And, and my heart is still beating fast and my skin is still warm because I've been dancing. And, you know, I've still got all those endorphins pumping through my body. I mean, that's just, that's a very physical thing. I can't send that down into the ground. You know, my body has experienced that. Or let's say I've done a really cathartic ritual and I've been, you know, sob puking on the ground, you know, the, the you know, sobbing till it's dry heaves kind of a thing. And I can't send that sorrow into the ground. You know, it doesn't just go away. I can't send my grief into the ground. It doesn't just go away. So I, I, I really see the idea of grounding as it's usually explained as, as, really, as really misleading. Um, and then there's the other place in ritual where you're supposed to be grounding, which is the, you know, usually at the beginning of the ritual. And it's you know, reaching down into the earth to, to take any energy that you need. And you know, I struggle with depression. And if that, if it was that easy to just reach down to the ground and take the energy that I need, I would not be dealing with the issues of depression and, and, you know, woe to anybody, (laughs) woe to anybody who says you're just not properly managing your energy. And that's why you have depression. You know, come and say that to my face and we'll have a different conversation. Um, (laughs) So, when I'm doing the, what is often called grounding at the beginning of a ritual, like you'll see it in my outlines, I call it grounding, but I often call it grounding and centering. And for me, what grounding is, is it's the beginning process of the ritual is starting and I am helping people focus and center themselves on the energy and the magic of what this ritual is about. That grounding energy starts when I do my pre-ritual talk and I let them know what the agreements are. And in the grounding function itself in the ritual in the beginning, I'm usually uh, either I or somebody else is leading some kind of a meditation-y piece. Um, There might have been singing and chanting as part of it. And it's to take us from that outer mundane space and into this sacred space mindset. So for me, that's what the function of grounding and centering is. The beginning of the ritual is to prepare us for this sacred space work and get our minds ready for it and start to get into that ritual, ritual groove. At the end of the ritual, it is returning to that mundane space and it is acknowledging that, you know, you've done a lot of work here and, you know, you've done a lot of energetic work and some of you are going to, you know, have things that you're going to be processing for a few days and a few weeks and that that's okay. And I give them permission to do that. Um, But here is some guacamole. Let's have a snack. (laughs) Um, Which also very much, you know, I'm I'm pragmatic, you know, I'm pragmatic about this stuff. And I think the the pragmatic stuff really serves. Um, That being said, there is, there's, uh, there's one thing that I think might help with the, with the spirit of your question. And that is when you have people who aren't quite themselves, even after a ritual is closing and what are ways you can care for those folks. So going back to my, you know, the ritual theme and, and me doing that pre-ritual talk, 
Um, so one of the agreements that I very frequently offer, particularly if we're going to be doing any kind of deeper work, is I offer an agreement for self-responsibility. And so what that is, is, is um, I'll talk about the theme of the ritual, and I'll, I'll use a Samhain ritual example again, because that's you know, easiest. But it's, you know, it's basically what I said earlier in, uh, in the webinar, which is, you know, so we're here for a Samhain ritual, and we're going to be going to the land of the dead. We're going to be going to the land of shadow, and the land of mystery, and the land of looking into the mirror, the dark mirror of our own souls. This is intensive work. This work can bring up a lot of your issues. And I want to be sensitive to that and let you know that each one of you stepping into this ritual, I empower you to do the work that is right for you. And if you find yourself dealing with shadow issues that are too much, if you find yourself dealing with uh, intensive trauma of your past, if you are a survivor of abuse, if you have been through incredibly traumatic experiences and you're finding yourself triggered by this, I give you the, the absolute empowerment over your, your own experience to take a step back from that. Don't feel pressured by me or by anybody else to do deeper, more intensive work. If you need to take a step back from that work, I empower you to do so. Um, I'll also specifically talk about emotional self-responsibility. And this goes into what I was saying um, about unasked for advice. Um, one of the things that happens, the reason we give unasked for advice and the reason, one of the reasons we try and hug people when they're crying is, is not exactly as altruistic as you might think. Um, one of the reasons that people sometimes try and crack the joke to break the tension or they try and give somebody the hug when they're crying is to make the person stop crying. Because when somebody is crying, it's uncomfortable for us. So a lot of my work as a leader and as a ritualist is just to get more comfortable with being uncomfortable. So what I will, what I will specifically and directly say is, we're, we're going to be doing this shadow work. And if you need to make sounds of grieving, if you are, if you are making sounds of joy, if you, are, if, you are, you know, if you are weeping, if you are crying, if you are laughing, if you are howling, whatever sounds you need to make when we're in the underworld and, and doing this work, you make those sounds. If you are on the floor crying, I'm going to leave you on the floor crying and let you take responsibility for yourself. If you need something, if, you, you know, if you've gone to a place and you cannot return, if you need some assistance, you know, come see me after the ritual and I'm happy to help with that. But during the course of the ritual, I'm going to let you have your space and assume that you are doing and processing what you need to do. And, you know, and so one of the reasons that I do that is, is A, to, well, and, I, and then I'll specifically say, and I'm going to ask all the rest of you to not go over and hug the person who's crying to let them have their process. And, you know, and then I'll say, you know, if you, if you want a hug, if you would like some physical comfort, like, you know, somebody to hug you, I said, you know, who all here is, is a hugger and, and okay with hugging somebody who, who is grieving and need, needs, you know, needs a hug. And, but, you know, half the room, you know, raise their hands up. I say, okay, so if you need a hug, you can ask for it. And, and someone will be willing to offer that. Um, but you know, other, other than that, please do not hug somebody unless they, they've asked for it. And, uh, one of the things that that prevents is there's a, there's a, there's a ritual problem that sometimes happens with these kinds of deep cathartic rituals where somebody melts down to draw attention to themselves. It's that whole psychological, um, any attention is better than no attention, even bad attention. And so they will often... Um, intentionally emotionally melt down in a place where lots of people will come over and comfort them and cosset them so that they become the center of attention. I do not have this happen in my rituals. It's, it's common. It's a common problem in, in deep cathartic rituals that you've got the drama queen who comes in and wants all the attention. It doesn't happen in my rituals because I set up these agreements. I've only had somebody melt down in my ritual once. Um, it's not to say that people are not affected by the rituals. And, you know, I sometimes have people who go to some pretty intensely dark places, but they, they're, you know, they're, they have responsibility for their, for their work. 
Um, I do remember a time I was leading a ritual in Chicago and there was a young woman and I want to say she was 18, but just body size wise, she was very small. Um, she, she looked far younger than her age and she was shaking after the ritual and she, I didn't know her, so I couldn't tell you what she sounds like normally, but to me, she sounded drunk. Um, she sounded altered and um, she, she had a hard time kind of, you know, responding to me when I was asking her questions about how she was. And, you know, other folks had alerted me to this. They said, you know, I, don't, I think she's not, she's not okay. She's not really, she, you know, she seemed really zoned out. Um, it was possible she did drugs before the ritual and, you know, or had, you know, was drunk. I, I don't know. I really, I, I don't know all the context of it. All I know is that she didn't quite read right to me as far as um, she seemed in, a, in an altered state, which ritual can do. And, uh, and it, so I talked to her and she said that this was her first ritual and it had been a pretty intensive, you know, energetic ritual. So, um, so I talked to her for a few minutes and she seemed to be, you know, she seemed to be kind of okay. She was starting to be able to sort of answer questions. Um, but I wanted to make sure to get her a ride home with, uh, you know, with somebody who I trusted. And um, so, you know, there, sometimes there are folks who get, who get really impacted by something and, um, and they just, you know, they, they need, they need time, you know? So what I did was I, I got, made sure, you know, that she had a ride home with somebody that I trusted um, I made sure she had my contact information and I said, look, intensive rituals like this sometimes take a few hours to work themselves out. I said, you're going to want to get something really, you know, something solid to eat. You're going to want to, you know, hydrate and, uh, you know, sleeping is probably the best thing. I said, if you're too keyed up to sleep, find something, you know, you might want to write about your ritual experience. You know, I gave her, I, I forget exactly what I said, but I, you know, I gave her a few things to do with that. But I said, you know, if, if you're still really affected by this, you know, contact me tomorrow and we can, we can talk through it. And she, she didn't contact me. Um, you know, I, I made really clear that if she, if she needed to talk things out, usually, you know, I will talk things out with people sometimes after ritual. Um, but so what I would say is if you're having trouble with people not coming back after ritual, what can really, really help is, uh, is setting up that self-responsibility ahead of time of like this, you know, it is your responsibility to only go as far as you're able to go and your responsibility to pull yourself back if that's not where you want to go. And it's your responsibility to, to bring yourself back at the end. And it, you know, and if you do go into a dark space, let me know. <laughs> well, we'll work that out and then we'll, we'll get you some help with that. But um, I really, I really try and leave it to people's sovereign responsibility for that and the, as much as I can. And the, and the reason is I don't want to be in that pedestal position of fixing people. I don't ever want to keep myself in that position. I'm also not fantastic at pastoral counseling. It's not my gift. Other people are great at it. I'm not. So I recognize that. Um, as a facilitator, it's like, okay, that's where I usually need to pass that off to somebody else who might be able to support them better. I can certainly sit there and listen to somebody if they have something that they need to process and just speak and be heard. That, that I can absolutely do. If they need more than that. There's, you know, not a whole lot that I can. So, you know, I, I would start out with the self-responsibility piece and, and teaching what grounding is and, and, you know, making sure that people understand that and, um, and under, you know, and understanding how they work. You know, some people after a ritual, they're, you know, they're, they're buzzed. And, you know, in my case, my debuzzing after a ritual is cleanup. <laughs> you know, I mean, by the time I've finished setting up the ritual, doing the ritual, dealing with all the social stuff after the ritual, and then cleaning up all the altars and the decorations, I'm quite tired. Um, so, you know, we, we just, that's part of self-responsibility too, is knowing how we each deal with that. I sometimes can be a total insomniac. Um, 
I know that about myself and I know to not bother to try and go to sleep if I'm in that kind of headspace. I have other stuff that I do to, you know, to, to manage that. I have, you know, I have busy work that I do. Well, you know, I'm not focused enough to write, but I can catch up on emails or whatever. So, you know, a lot of, I would say a lot of that is, is self-knowledge and self-responsibility. But that being said, you know, if you've done that and if you still have people that are having a hard time coming back and if food isn't really bringing them back, um, like this one woman that, that I mentioned where she just, she seemed really shaky, you know, the, the very best thing you can do is just make sure that they get home safe and let them know that they can talk to you more after. Um, I would have been happy to sit and talk with her more, but she was not talkative. She, she didn't really seem like, I didn't want to press her to process things that she didn't really seem to want to, to want to process with me. So again, I'm, um, I'm not sure that, you know, we, we had to kind of talk about the definition of grounding um, on that one uh, because neither, neither one of us really works with that term. <laughs> well, and, but it, it is important to even talk about it, even in this webinar, because it, like you said, it's a common problem mm -hmm. because in many ways, I was taught that grounding meant you just basically dump everything, but you need a lot of that energy to keep yourself going. You know, for me, you just want to balance out. And usually, if someone is after ritual, not quite themselves, it it makes more sense ethically for me to say, let's try to balance your energies. Let, let's do our best to balance your energies. Let's talk about the mundane to get us back. And then so we can start to process everything else in the background instead of saying, let's just all ground. Well, and if you're, and that's, you make a really good point because if you're saying, and let's all ground together, you're taking people back into magical space. So I'll, I'll give you another like Instagram <laughs> technique for people. Um, I, I actually use this quite frequently when I'm facilitating. Uh, I, I'll, I'll be clear. I don't use this in ritual but I use this when I'm either when I'm teaching a ritual, I'm sorry, when I'm teaching a workshop or after a ritual when, um, so there's this kind of thing and it feels really weird to say this. So I'm, I'll just be transparent about that. When you're an author and you're a teacher and you're a ritualist, like people get this starry eyed kind of like they, you know, Oh, you're so amazing. And I see the goddess and you like, you know, yeah, I, I, that sometimes happens with people. And when, when I, when I see people doing the starry eyed thing and, and I realize that I'm, you know, they've put me up on the pedestal, uh, I'll drop an F bomb. I will, I will say something crass uh, or very colloquial. I'll use slang. And, uh, and I do that very intentionally to let them know that I put my priestess pants on one leg at a time just like everybody else, you know, I, I, I do that to remind people that I'm a human being and it, and it really does reground people in, in the mundane. Um, it, it, uh, I don't often do it after a ritual unless somebody is really, um, it's kind of like an emergency <laughs> hazard button, you know, it's, but it's like, if somebody is really, um, putting their power onto me. And what I mean is like, they're seeing me as being powerful and, and themselves as, as not being powerful. Um, I, I will say something, you know, use, I'll use swear words or something, or just say, say something, you know, in a way, a very colloquial way, just to make sure that they understand that I'm just a human being and I'm fallible. And, and uh, you know, and I also work to redirect it, it back at them. And I say, no, you, you, you are the source of your own power. I am just here to facilitate the process. And, you know, I might say something like, you know, fuck, anybody can do this if, if you try hard enough. And it's just, you know, I'm, I'm doing that intentionally to, to bring them back into, into, into their bodies, into mundane space. Um, it, I'm very careful about when I do that because it can be very jarring. Um, you know, especially, you know, there's people who don't like the F word. Um, it's one of my personal favorite swear words. So, you know, <laughs> but I, I do sometimes do that intentionally uh, just to, to remind people that, you know, it's, we're coming back into mundane space and, and I, I intentionally talk like a normal person um, and talk about geeky things and make pop culture references as opposed to talking in mystical, magical, ritual 
you know, trancy voice. So. If you have any questions about ritual facilitation or leadership for pagan groups, please feel free to contact me. I love questions and I love writing articles or recording videos for actual issues that people are facing in the community. If this webinar is useful for you, please consider donating. It is my goal to make this education available for all, but to do that I have to pay the bills. I also have several books available, and there are links below under Show More, or you can contact me via my website or social media.